Welcome to the Harvest 2020 Spot Farm Results Week. The live stream session will start shortly. Before we begin, we want to remind you of some housekeeping. You will stay muted throughout the live session so we can't hear you. The session is scheduled to be either one or one and a half hours long, including questions. To ask the speakers a question, use the stage chat found on the right hand side of your screen. Please do not ask questions for the live session in the main events chat. This session will be recorded and will be available to watch again on the HDB Potatoes YouTube channel and the HDB website. At the end of the session, we will provide you with a unique basis and Neuroso code, which you should keep note of for each session that you attend. Don't forget to apply for points using the basis and Neuroso application forms, which can be found in the reception area. Join the conversation online by following HDB Potatoes on Twitter and use the hashtag SpotFarmResults2020. Finally, if you have any issues with the conference platform, contact the team on events at ahdb.org.uk. We hope that you enjoy the Harvest 2020 Spot Farm Results Week. Your session will now start. Hello and, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the final um, uh, session that we have uh, this week, and it covers uh, quite a, a, a meaty topic. Uh, it's potato cul uh, cultivations, um, what's good and what's bad, what's too deep. And uh, we've got some really great speakers for you this afternoon. Um, first up, we've got Keir uh, Howitson from Scotland. Uh, later on, then we'll have uh, Philip Wright, cultivations uh, specialist. Uh, then we've got Andrew Wilson, a potato farmer in the uh, the wolds of, of Yorkshire. And then finally, uh, we'll have a discussion with uh, with Will Gag in North Lincolnshire. Um, very much uh, conversational. There's only a few slides between all of us. So it's very much uh, us having conversations. And I really, uh, really want you to, to um, fill some questions in, ask some questions in the, the chat box on the right of your screen and uh, we can put this we'll have a, a panel session once we've got to uh, uh what got through everybody we'll have a panel discussion and i'll try and feed questions to the to the right people um it is um it's your opportunity really to ask the the, the questions that you wanted to ask there's no sales pressure there's no um uh, um uh, thinking that you need to do one thing or the other but it is if you're thinking you want to change your system if you want to do something differently or you just want to brush up on what uh, what your cultivations plan is going to be for this spring then uh, this is the the time to ask um so yes keep going keep asking the questions and uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll fire them at the uh, the, the right people to uh, um, at the end of the session we've got about an hour and a half to go through so i think we'll have a, have a really good session so what i'm going to do now is is kick off with a short video about the the work that's been done in Spot Scotland. Um, we're on Keir Howitson's farm, and uh, then we'll introduce Keir to you, and we'll have a conversation about the work that uh, has been carried out there. So, can we have the video, please? So, Mark Stallam at Spot Farm 2017 in Scotland, basically looking at the first of the commercial treatments in the cultivation demonstration. So standard practice before we started in 2016 was to bed form at 12 inches or 30 centimetres, bed till to the full depth down to 12 inches and then destone down to the same depth. So we've got a bed effectively 30 centimetres deep. The work that we've been doing with AHDB over the period sort of 2011 to 2016 has shown that we can come appreciably shallower than that, maybe two, three centimetres and still achieve a marketable yield that's as high or higher than the standard practice that many growers actually do. So we've asked our question over that five year period of AHDB work to look at why we need to cultivate considerably deeper than we currently plant, maybe 15, 16 centimeters here on a plant here in this field, looking at the seed size and looking at how deep the deepest tubers are, the optimal depth for actually harvesting would be somewhere in the region of 27, 28 centimeters of cultivated soil to harvest. So that's a saving of two or three centimetres that we could gain. What's that going to have in terms of productivity? The results of the previous work showed that we've got over 70 experiments where the direction is that we can actually improve yields by around two tonnes per hectare by coming two or three centimetres shallower in all of our operations. 
So we talk about destoning depth. If we come shallower in that depth, we can also bed till. If we bed till shallower, we can also bed form shallower as well. So the whole system needs to be matched to the deepest depth that you're actually cultivating for planting. The treatments we've got at Spot Farm this year are very much reduced. We had eight last year, we've only got four this year. And the biggest contrast are really, do we need to bed till? So we've taken that out as an operation, which is appreciable saving in costs and what is really quite a slow operation. The other one is to basically shallow destone, but bed till only the top half of the bed down to six inches rather than the full depth of 12. Interestingly, the steering committee came up with another approach that whereby instead of bed forming, they would actually bed till directly onto the plough in a wide system. So a large tractor is required to pull that through, but it saves an operation. We're looking at costs and we're looking at overall labour savings in terms of the planting operation. But ultimately the growers are here to look at the crop as it appears in the growing situation. And when they get the results back, either from the results day or from pack out data, they'll actually be able to appreciate what they've seen in the field and perhaps see there were no differences actually in the crop growing behind them and see that actually we've got an improvement in yield and improvement in productivity. So from that, I mean, uh, there's lots of online chat, uh, Twitter and, and farming forum and places like that, that would have you believe that the the thing to do with potato cultivations is go as deep as a tractor will have it, get the finest crumb you can get, and that will guarantee you the yield and guarantee you your uh, quality. Um, but the research shows that's not quite the case. And if I was to sit here and say, well, we can save you a litre or two uh, per hectare of fuel if you come out the ground, um, that you wouldn't really, well, I think well, you wouldn't really bother. But hang on, there's an appreciable yield difference and an appreciable yield increase in, in uh, getting, um, doing less. And genuinely, less is, or could well be more. And so I'd like to bring in Keir, who was, uh, whose farm this uh, research was based on, and, um, and just bring him into the, the conversation as well and, and ask a few questions. So, Keir, do you want to just, just uh, uh, outline your business, how many potatoes you grow and the soil type, and whereabouts are you? Yep. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Keir Hertzson. I am potato manager for Bruce Farms. We, we're based uh, just outside Meeple in Perthshire. We're growing about uh, 750 acres of potatoes uh, between two sites. We're growing roughly 500 acres here uh, based, uh, based in Meeple, and we're growing in a, a satellite operation down in the Scottish borders. Um, all our potatoes are destined for packing. Uh, we're not doing any processing, anything like that. Um, we grow a wee bit of ware, a wee bit of salads, and the rest is of home saved seed. All our all our potatoes go to Bartlett. That's that's the sort of the, the, the packer that we use. And most of our soil around about here would be any yeah, medium to heavy loam probably. Yep. Okay. And has your cultivation strategy changed as a result of the research on your farm? Yeah, I think uh, we were obviously spot farm hosts from 2016 to 2019. 2016 was very much a, a soft launch uh, in, into the sort of spot farm project for us. Year 2016, year one was just all cultivations. From then, from 2017, 18 and 19, we added nutrition, uh, seed space and all these other things. But cultivations has sort of been the main, the main thing uh, that we were interested in. One, because we felt it was a very important part of the whole growing potato process, it's very key. If there was, uh, if you made a few mistakes at potato planting time or there was issues then, then you would carry them all the way through the season. You would then lose out on potentially yield, pack out, uh, and probably incorporate it at the end of the day. So, so cultivations was one of the key things. I think through the course of the, the four years that we, we sort of concentrated on cultivations, we did see uh, a sort of big shift from less, maybe not cultivating as deep, would give us a better a better yield and pack, but also maybe even reduced cultivations, uh, taking out bed tilling, for instance, would still give us a better yield and a better pack out. And that's obviously with losing quite a lot of costs because bed tilling would be one of our biggest costs, I would think, through the, the planting process. 
Yeah, and, and um, whilst other machines are available, what uh, bed tiller and size are you using at the minute? We're just we're using single bed tillers. Uh, we we used to be, in hindsight, we used to be quite guilty of bed tilling to speed up a stone separator. Uh -huh. uh, all sort of changed part of the way through our spot, spot farm project. We 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 bought another stone separator. Um, so we, we had instead of three stone separators, we now had four. We had another planter, and I would rather not bed, bed at all, to be honest. Um, we do still have bits that we need to bed till a wet, heavier end rig or areas of the field. But in the past, we probably bed till the whole field, whereas now, if there's a, a quarter of the field needs bed till, we'll bed till that and just basically do the bare minimum, even if it means reversing a quarter way up the field from the end and just pulling from there out to the end of the field. Uh -huh. And so there's not been a reduction in machines on farm, but there's been a change in, in management, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, we, there's still a place for a bed till because I say we, everybody's got those heavier fields that, that you do need a bed till, but we're certainly from probably bed tilling about 90% of our land, we will be bed tilling probably on an average year less than 15, 20%. Well, wow. okay, so that's quite a, and that speeds up the operation hugely, I guess, in in the spring. Yes, it it, it does. Um, I think I'd rather I'd rather a four stone separator is going slightly slower than uh, three stone separators on a bed tiller trying to keep out in front. To be honest, um, I mean the, the bed tilling between labour, fuel, and wearing parts is, is as I say, is the most expensive operation in in our sort of planting plans. Yeah, and have you seen? Uh, well, you've seen yields increase and, and marketable yield increase as well from these activities. Yeah, we, ha we have through the spot farm, um, we have, uh, yeah, qu quite considerably. And Mark Stalin was obviously quite uh, involved in the spot farm Scotland, and it was him that was quite keen on trying reduced bed tilling, uh, trying no bed tilling as well. And, and I think the, the results we got kind of spoke for themselves. There were over the four years that the, the key things that we took away were reduced cultivations, i.e. probably less bed tilling. And the other thing, which is not sort of cultivation related is um, reduction of nitrogen when growing potatoes as well. So. Uh, just outline that the reduction in nitrogen in how, how has that occurred? Uh, it was just, it was, it was sort of a, an idea that we had first of the second year. Uh, Mark Stalin was always, obviously quite uh, vocal about we were putting too much nitrogen on. We have a sort of base rate fertiliser that we put on planting time and then we will top dress potatoes per variety, per field. Um, and, and yeah, it was just a, it was a trial. We, we went ahead with our, our, our base fertiliser over all the plots. One plot we top dressed, one plot we didn't. And lo and behold, after the first year, we did get a, a better yield out of the, the crop that, that didn't get any top dressing on. So that sort of pricked our ears up a wee bit. Um, we decided on the, the third year, see how far we could push it, to see how far, see how much we could cut off. So then we then reduced our base rate fertilizer planting time. And that, uh, we were quite uh, ruthless in, in how much we cut back. We, we basically gave it half, half what the, the rest of the crop got. And you could see a difference, but we'd obviously taken it too far. We, we saw a, a reduced yield. We didn't get as good a pack out in that. So yeah, we were, we were basically, our, our nitrogen wise, we were putting on 147 kilos a hectare of nitrogen at planting time. And we're topping up with roughly another 40 kilos um, through the season. So, I think a lot of it also has to do with orga organic matter of our soils. Um, the fields we were in were very high, high in organic matter, up sort of seven, eight, nine percent, which does make a huge difference. So, say so one of the things we do routinely do now is we will test our organic matter before we plant the potatoes because if it's if we do have a high organic matter, I am more confident as to cut back nitrogen. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And and harvest is that has that changed the ease of harvest? Um, not not a huge difference in, in harvest time um, for any with our cultivations a wee bit yeah you know if, if sometimes harvest is a wee bit slower if there's a wee bit more clod in it but I mean most of the fields we were in for a spot farm were sort of standard medium loam fields there wasn't a, a tricky field that was always it was always commented on that uh, you know we're, we're in a good field we should maybe have had a year 
where we were in a really tricky field, um, uh, you know, a field or a light sandy field, but it's uh, we're trying to keep it as uh, sort of routine as possible. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, thanks for that, uh, uh, Keir. Um, we'll uh, we'll come back to you when we have the the the, uh, the panel session. There's a couple of questions yeah. come in already. I'll 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 reserve them at the minute until uh, until we're all together. Then we can probably all tackle them together. But uh, yeah. for now, thanks for that, Keir. Okay. And we can hand over to uh, Philip Wright. Um, Philip, many of you will know, um, he's uh, a ba based in Boston and cultivation specialist. Um, and if you haven't seen him speak at some event or somewhere, then then you, you've been living under a stone. Um, Philip's got a, a couple of um, a, a few slides to go through, just illustrating the uh, the um, uh, some of the finer points of cultivations. Just introducing you, Philip. The, the the thing that on that last video was the three depths of cultivation were all at the same depth. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've got some interest in that. There's comments on that as well. Indeed, Harry. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think that's something from a cultivation point of view. If you can, if you can keep your your cultivation depths distinct and not work to a, a common depth, it can it can certainly improve or reduce the the risk of soil damage or creating bar <coughs> barriers to water and soil movement. So that's something that uh, is very, yeah, it's very pertinent. And I, I think it was it was interesting to see both Kia's comments and actually the uh, uh, comments on the video there. I, I think I think there's some common stuff. So if I may, I'll, I'll just whip through very quickly a few a few principles for everybody. And, and I apologise, I'm teaching most people how to suck eggs so just just review those in um if you like in the context of the potato crop um and also the cultivations preceding leading up to it as well as when you when you're actually doing the actual uh, bed forming or tilling or whatever operations now most of these principles are covered in a couple of publications uh, by hdb not to uh, wanting to plug it for too long harry but the the principles principles of soil management um, booklet and the the arable soil management cultivation and establishment booklet uh, have got some quite um, pertinent stuff so you can pick up a lot of what i'm just going to go through uh, from those two so if we just think initially about um, doing appropriate cultivations clearly soil moisture is absolutely critical for all of that um, as you know if you grab a lump of soil from uh, both the surface to, to understand what's going to happen with the, the tractive side of things, but also from cultivation depth, roll it between the palms of your hand. If you can get it performing like the middle picture there and starting to crumble, as opposed to performing like the picture on the right hand side where we've got a plastic worm, then clearly we're in more of a friable state here. And that's what we're aiming at or somewhere between friable and slightly drier if we're trying to loosen and restructure. And as everyone will be aware, um, it, it, it's hugely important at times when you're pushing limits of, of, of uh, timeliness of crop establishment, uh, bed forming, preparing for the, for the crop, it's highly likely that moisture is right on the edge and, and the deeper you go, the nearer you're going to get to those plastic limits. So if it's possible to save some uh, amount of depth, I would suggest you're probably going to be in a much better position for getting better tilth. And, and you know, it, it has been known in the past, you can, you can lift separators up half an inch or an inch and, and actually get more, more soil as a result of not bringing up so much plastic soil and forming clods, because that's the other risk. So clearly part of that principle is, is getting good drainage. It's the best, it's probably the most important factor when you're farming is good drainage, both if you like from a macro scale with ditches, but also getting drainage through the profile efficiently at all times, which is back to this topic that Harry, you've just brought up of, of minimizing working at common depths, because that will create planes of weakness that can hold water up. If we think about prevention as well as, as cure, um, obviously applying a pressure to the soil, tyre track pressure, is going to squeeze the porosity down. And we need good porosity uh, throughout the profile. 
an intensively cultivated profile is inherently quite weak. So we, we, we've got to try and maintain that by minimizing pressure. The little graph, I'm sure you've all seen this before. If, if we measure stress in the soil through to depth for the same axle load, if we reduce pressure in the tire or under the track by, uh, it's more difficult with, with common weight under a track, but certainly with tire pressure, one can do that. We start to reduce stress and the dotted lines represent root growth. These are, the, the, these are quite ambitious for potatoes. They're, they're more of a cereal uh, indicator. Good root growth being the green line, uh, average root growth and poor root growth. You can see as we reduce pressure, we're actually getting nearer to a situation where we're not actually inhibiting roots. So if, if we could get to our target applied pressure on the surface of 0.7 of a bar or less, so in old money, single figure pounds per square inch in reality, then we, we, we can start to minimize having to correct a problem that we, we could otherwise have created. Uh, so that's probably food for thought. If you, if you think of, of weight applied and keep pressure constant now for a second, these tires have all got the same pressure in, but have got increased weight on them. What weight does is push problem deeper, but the extent and severity of the problem is governed by pressure. So that out of the two is the more important. If you've got two tractors, one of which is slightly heavier or heavier, but is capable of exerting lower pressures because it's got better tire gear on, I would strongly suggest that's probably the first port of call. If you can keep weight down, clearly that's very important. Remembering that that first pass across the soil, you can incur a lot of damage. And what that means in terms of effect on yield, clearly, if we take an average reduction as a result of compaction, and, and potatoes are particularly responsive to that with, a, with, with those sort of values per hectare, attention to detail to get pressures right can be really important. So if, if we think of problem areas in the potato crop, again, typical picture here, We've got various areas below or at plough depth. Clearly, we're going to incur greater levels of damage if we're ploughing in furrow or we're ploughing when soil at plough depth is, is plastic. We, we're going to incur some quite significant risk to damage there. If we come to bed tilling or separation depth, and again, if that's a common depth, there's a risk of common planes being created, but there's 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 clearly a, a potential issue there. If we think about the wheelings, then a direct pressure effect and also um, along the, uh, the actual base of the ridge as well. If we can, if we can reduce these sort of areas, then uh, clearly prevention again than cure. Uh, if we're thinking about putting eradicators in here or removing problems, clearly very difficult if you've got stone row um, you might want to think about focusing and concentrating on the area to either side rather than directly down the centre. Uh, and, and then below planting depth damage, again, if, if soil is moist when you're planting, there's more risk of damage. Uh, and, and less is more clearly if we're trying to get infiltration into ridges, less has got to be more. If we can get more of a stable, resilient structure, not quite as fine as, 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 as well, fine enough but not overly fine then we're going to allow give ourselves a better chance for that infiltration to work if we're thinking about restructuring the soil as preparation i'm thinking now really as opposed to at the time then if we're pulling tines through the soil it's very important to lift and stretch that profile in order to do that we've got to have less than plastic conditions by definition uh, in in addition to that the deeper we work the more lift height we need to lift and stretch effectively. So we, we end up really working between the lines of this envelope. Greater lift height than necessary, we risk over disturbing, over cultivating, uh, a, a reduced lift height than necessary. Um, we potentially not gonna do enough to stretch it. We're potentially gonna probably even start to smear upwards, uh, which can be a risk. And and there is an indirect, another benefit if, if um, if you're thinking now well ahead of the potato crop, but in preparation again, if you can integrate a growing root into that loosening process, either before directly or during, or even before you've uh, before you've loosened, if you can get a, a, 
for example, a cover crop root growing, it's possible then to use those roots to stabilize that structure and hold, hold that soil apart as, as, as well as together. Um, clearly two sort of desperately poor pictures here of performance in a, in a, in a wetter time. Bed tilling uh, effect at depth, creating that plate, which is then a, um, a barrier to water and roots. Clearly, if we're cultivating and bed tilling at near a plastic situation, that also is a problem. Uh, and that leads me on briefly to think about the geometry of the wearing parts. Um, clearly, some uh, component parts are, are going to have a greater uh, tendency to smear than others. For example, L-type blades can smear more than pick type or, or other um, chisel type blades. But it, 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 it's important to think about the actual where to all components here even a even the pick type time when that develops a rearward rake on it we're, we're, we're introducing more compacting consolidating type action rather than lifting and loosening and that, that can even be to move the soil sideways if you get the thing uh, rounding off at the front so maintaining a, a sharp uh, um, a horizontal cutting edge rather than letting it uh, radius off will allow those components to be more effective uh, in, in all cases and if we think um, of potential solutions of um, bed tilling type application here um, there are one or two uh, work was done a few years ago there's one or two co commercial uh, components available now to consider if, if, you, if there is risk of creating a, a small plane of weakness at depth, at cultivating depth, it's possible to introduce a very small lifting tine before you plant while you're doing the bed tilling operation to, to actually remove that just in the zone where the potato is ultimately going to be planted. So we actually help help the thing along in this area here. Um, and and you, you do see now a few commercially available components on on tillers that, that, that are designed just to do this. They've got enough lift height, very subtle, it's not going to put the draft of the thing up at all, really. We're just really just trying to attack that very thin plastic plate uh, and, and provide some drainage access through that so that when water does start to be applied or is, is, is involved, it doesn't immediately seal that plate up. Clearly, we could do that with other um, tilling operations as well, but we've got to be careful that we don't lift stone into the zone. So it does present problems with tiller star, other types of machine, um, trying to find the area where to put this really, because we want to be obviously behind the share because that's potentially where we are incurring the damage, but we've got to be uh, before in an ideal world, the, the, the soil is deposited on top so we don't bring and mix up stone through that soil. So there are challenges on some, but uh, if it provides people food for thought, then that, that might be just at this stage something to consider. So, yeah, I, I think my, my message really in line with, with Mark and Kiers is that can you do less and actually achieve a better result? I, I believe it's possible. Um, certainly avoiding too fine a tilt remember those barriers to infiltration barriers to water and soil uh, barriers to water and root movement sorry clearly both very important remembering that soil moisture at time of tilling at time of cultivation massively important uh, it may be we just work shallower because we're going to do less damage um, synergies between roots and metal exist um, we're, we're looking at this uh, in, at all times now because if we can if we can get a win-win situation using roots at the end of the day roots are the things that structure soil honestly metal is a means to an end but it's probably a very important means to an end at times uh, avoiding common depth operations massively important at all times when you're cultivating irrespective of the crop um, if you could default default to less rather than more to shallower rather than deeper less risk of plastic uh, action then on the soil and yeah if we can prevent it if we can control our pressures um, it's certainly preferable um, it may need to be used in conjunction to cure so uh, hopefully that uh, gets me to where i need to be uh, harry for you
No, that's excellent. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Philip. That's um, um, just the job. I, I, I'm just picking up on your first slide, really, the because everyone in the spring gets itchy wheels and wants to get out there and get going and, and crack on. Um, you really want to be testing the soil for its plasticity at the bottom of your working depth, I assume. Exactly, Harry. Yeah, I think I think it's often a, it's often not done. Um, you, you can kick the soil on the surface. You can you can you know you, use the boot and determine whether whether it's appropriate. But very very important at the depths we're moving it to. Very important at share depth. You know, a, a share action on a soil is attempting to shear it attempting it, it its natural action is to shear the soil so if if we start to impose a shear action on soil the very least you'd expect is that any continuous vertical pores that are there naturally are going to attempt to be cut and sheared if we then get water as we're going to do we're going to introduce it uh, to irrigate the crop we're going to have rainfall if that starts to wash fines down through the profile there's a very quick tendency to block the filter up in want, for want of a better word. And if you've compromised the filter by shearing it for a start, it's not long before it can really create a big barrier. Yeah. And even you could say, well, OK, well, I'll put um, soil loosening legs ahead of the, uh, the the bed tiller. That could make the situation worse or it'll, it'll solve one problem and create another. It, it can. I, I, I think the. The, the best place to consider a leg, if, if you do need one, is, is after the, the rotor has done its job. Um, I've done some work, as, as one or two guys will know, on, on loosening um, elements behind stone and cloth separation shares. Um, the best place to put them is after the share. Um, we have to be careful not to bring up stone, um, but if, if, it's, if we have created a bit of a plate, all we're after trying to do then is just gently stretch it, just produce some cracks in there, and only really in the zone where the potato is growing. Uh, that, that's the good starting point. Allow the roots to get down through, allow the water to get down. Um, they can both exploit, the roots can exploit a greater depth of soil far easier and far better then. Yeah, yeah, super. Um, okay. Um, and there's lots of talk. I don't know if you have any experience on, on de-stoning and whether de-stoning is uh, overused um, or is there different, is there a tiller star? Maybe we'll pop this question on uh, to the panel really, but uh, something like a tiller star that will bury stones. Is is that better? Is that, do you have any experience in that? I, th I think, I think um, the... <laughs> The old adage, the answer lies in the soil. It lies on the soil type you're on. It, 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 yeah. For me, um, are you separating stone or are you trying to eliminate clod or both? Um, mm. A key thing is, is to eliminate clod or reduce the amount of clod you have it to sift out. And I think we come back to that plastic, potentially plastic zone at depth or near a plastic zone at depth. The minute we put that under compression, and shear as we're forcing it up the share we've got a degree of compression honestly that an inch shallower would make can make a huge difference um yeah. i have been on um farms with really good operators where they're they're playing with depth clearly at all times they're looking at the discharge they're, ju they're judging that they're seeing what's coming off and they're tweaking the depth at all times because often you can tweak it slightly shallower and the discharge goes down because we're just losing less clod. It's not stone, it's actually the clod that we're losing. And the clod has been formed as a result of moving plastic soil. Soil will fail by compression when you move it when it's plastic. By definition, you start to create a clod then. Yep, yep. So you make you make the situation worse by trying to make it better almost. Yeah, yep. yeah, okay. very much. Yeah. Right, well, that's great. Thank you, thank you, Philip. Um, that's that's you off the hook for now. We'll uh, we'll bring you back for the uh, we'll bring you back for the panel discussion uh, uh, in a in a uh, in a little while. I can see some good questions coming up, so that should be good. Yeah, yeah, we'll get we'll get some banter going. That's for sure. Um, right. Well, thank you, Philip. Um, that, that's 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 some good information there. Again, keep keep the questions coming in if you've got something for Philip or for the, any, or any of your other, uh, our other speakers. Um, now we'll change, we'll go north slightly. We'll um, 
we'll go uh, we'll head to the wolds of yorkshire and uh, andy wilson and um he was involved he's been had a long involvement in um the hdb potatoes and the potato council before that and uh, and I think just when I started um, work, I turned up to a field near Castle Howard and uh, and and listened to Andrew talk about his his findings in uh, cultivations as well. So, Andrew, thanks for coming. Uh, can you just um, introduce your farm business? How many potatoes? Your soil type and and the type of potatoes you grow. Sure. Yeah. Afternoon, everybody. Yeah, we're a tenant farmer on Castle Howard Estate. We are, we're on the edge of the walls, but we're in Rydale District. We don't have that nice freeze rain and stuff that the walls provides. We do have a wide range of soil from limestone to sandy loam. This farm's not called Brickyard for nothing. We have our share of clay. Um, it can be quite a challenge at times. Uh, we grow about 240 acres of potatoes, all for processing, half for, for chipping, half for crisping is a rough split. Store virtually all of them. Um, to go out between November and March. Um, we embarked on a, we've been doing trials for quite a long time now, but we embarked on the uh, involvement with the Potato Council in 2013 after a very small scale one in 2012. The Slingsby trials, as they became known, was in 2013, focused mostly on cultivations. And that was quite an eye opener, really, on soil textures and fineness of bed uh, and how we can do things better. And that's slowly transformed how we, how we do things. We used to run two single tillers. We then went to a, a double tiller, ridging straight into the ploughing, which was quite good in that we could run at a shallower depth. So we're just hitting the hard plot on the surface and not going into the damper stuff underneath. As a principle, that, that wasn't bad. Um, but you get to a point where you can't leave anything tilled overnight that's not planting if, it, if it's a catchy time because it turns to some kind of porridge. Um, and that put a lot of pressure on the tiller that he couldn't keep in front. We didn't need a, a particularly big tractor for anything else. Um, so going three bed was me going to mean hiring something enormous with auto steer and things. It got very, it was going to be very expensive. Um, and to cut a long story short, we don't do that anymore uh, unless we get a feel that bakes out on us, and then it's a tool we can use. Um, we've uh, we do things quite a bit differently now. I don't know quite how far you want me to go, Harry. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I remember in 2013, I think uh, we, you, were, you were trying a, a tiller star and you smiled and said the, fa the highest speed we can get is 0 0.6, 0 0.7 of a kilometre per hour, which is painful. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, about word for word perfect, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure you used the word painful, but anyway. Um, <laughs> there may have been an adjective in there somewhere. There might have been. Um, but uh, what, what, so what do you do now? Are, are you on the plough or are you before the plough? We, we started growing cover crops in 2011, um, dipped the toe in the water, made quite a lot of mistakes in the early years. Um, but in 2015, I think, real, really wet spring, in desperation, we stuck a Bonford superfloor into a field before we ploughed it because it was far too wet. It was all slumped and soggy. There had nothing growing on it all winter. What the hell are we going to do with it? Um, we stuck a superfloor in it just to try and dry it out a bit because it was ploughing like baking sides. We ploughed it a few days later when it had dried, we dragged it again, we ridged it and planted it and thought, hang on a minute, that would make things a lot easier. So the following year, we, we tried to, we bought a Simba TL cultivator. And we demoed one. Andrew, this was, with, this was not ploughing, so you hadn't ploughed this? This, it was, it was dragged before the plough, that's the unconventional okay. part of it. We still okay. ploughed it, okay. but some would call that recreational cultivation. But the difference that it made was staggering. Um, so with it, the cover crop was seems to be doing something for us, but how can we get more value from it? The drag before the plough had made things much more friable, much easier to cultivate. There must be something in it. Um, we, we demoed a horse Tirano that was an eye watering sit down in a dark room type of a price. Um, we couldn't justify it. We found a second hand one, uh, a Simba TL with the same legs on. What a game changer. What a game changer. Um, we pulled that through some cover crops, some that had been mulched, some that hadn't, and some stubbles, a bit of an experiment. Um, a few days in front of the plough, and the theory being is get that top eight or nine inches friable and dried before we plough it. Not dry, as in drill it with a seed drill dry, but drier than it had been. So when you plough it, what you turn down is drier soil, not wetter soil. It's much mm -hmm. more friable. It's much more easy, much easier to cultivate. You're not 
battling with big fat wet furrows. Um, followed the plough then a couple of days after with the same cultivator again. Um, rid it up and plant it. And in a nutshell, that's reduced our bed tilling from about 150% 10 years ago down to 40% now. So quite a bit we don't bed till at all. That that has made big differences in we don't get the row slumping, the capping, the cracking, with less greens and with easier harvesting. That that has really extracted some value from the cover crops by altering the cultivation of, regime. And what sort of depth are you bed tilling at? As as shallow as we can get away with, but as deep as we need to. Um, if it's dry on the surface and we're suffering with, a, we've had some beds that have dried out on us. It's been really dry in sunshine, wind, um, and the top of the bed's gone hard. We can probably get away with running half depth because it's only the hard plod that's creating the problems on the day stoner. Also, I will say that the the, the other thing that made made the difference was this, we've got a standard uni style. We had a, a day stoner upgrade, 2015 or 16. And that does make the difference if you've got a lot of cover crop a lot of muck and some fire particularly some some fluffier type of soil types with a web machine that the fire the increased fiber in the bed because that's that's the key thing that makes the difference you've not buried the cut the fiber whatever it might be muck stubble even stubble but yeah. muck cover crop material you've not buried it in a layer underneath the bed you've mixed it into the full profile which is completely opposite to, to black grass lessons but we're not we're not we're too worried about that in potatoes we've mixed that fiber into the bed which can then in a damp time cling to the bars of a web de stoner whereas the uni star just gobbles it all up there is a there is a, a sieving underweb underneath it but by the time it hits the web and it's a bigger web than it used to be is that we've we don't have them issues at all um yeah so the, the 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 few things combined has made quite a difference to us really so certainly reduced cost of establishment yeah, fantastic. And and what's your destruction policy with the cover crops? Any glyphosate used, or or you just go straight in? We do use glyphosate occasionally, particularly if, if it's a not like the last two years, but if it's a year where cover crops are quite big, or if it's a farm where we know there's particularly a grass weed issue and there's a lot that's grown in the cover crop, we will use we will use glyphosate. Yes, one of the lessons we learned was don't get the cover crops too thick. Um, in the early years, it was. Just, up here somewhere, um, big thick crops think you're doing a lot of good, and that creates quite a lot of wet mulch, uh, and you struggle to get the soil underneath dry enough in spring. So what what you've gained, you tend we're tending to lose it by everything being too wet. Um, so don't grow them quite, don't drill them quite as thick, so they don't by naturally enough by the bits plants being more spaced out by drilling them at lower seed rates, they don't grow as tall anyway because they aren't as much in competition with each other. The important bit is what's going on underneath the ground, not what's above space just as vital as your eyes really um the key thing is that is the roots not necessarily the green material um, so yeah so so we do um, flail it we will flail it if it's if it's if i think there's enough cover crop there to and then enough particularly if there's been muck as well if we've got a foot and a half of cover crop and we've put muck on it we'll tend to with a, a three bed potato topper and we just change the long flails for short flails on that goes in the wheelings and top it with that it helps justify the topper as well to be fair top that with top it before before we muck it so that we don't get we don't finish up with all the organic matter down the trench it's no use to us there basically no 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 fair enough and and just a, a brief word on your choice of cover crop what's the what's the ideal choice mix for you um that that keeps getting tweaked but predominantly it's oats mustard uh vetch and radish um if we've got a farm where there isn't beans on the rotation, we will put beans in instead of vetch, which I think it does more for, for building fertility and it's a little bit more vigorous rooted and it's cheaper. Um, the, the radish is something that we're working on from a point of view of PCN. Um, I think there's miles in the mileage in that. We're not in the right part of the country for things like caliente mustard and things like that. Um, and crimson clover is another interesting one that I'm looking to incorporate next year from a from a, a nematode point of view. I think that's the red light is on the nematodes now. We've lost five it. We, we do need to to push on a little bit harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. But uh, principally, I'm a, I'm a Yorkshireman. Keep it cheap. With a with a ten pound uh, ceiling on the the cover cup seed uh and the establishment i've just gone gone back in time a little bit and bought an old eight meter drill to drill the cover crops with because the amount that we were sowing was very slow and very, uh, and predominantly getting more expensive we're wearing the drill out too fast 
Um, and it was eating into time, particularly in the catchy season, like we've just had, well, we're still combining it February to September. Um, it was eating into time, we should have been drilling wheat. So we bought a cheap eight metre drill to bank some cover crops in a bit faster because I'm a, a firm believer that they are bringing up more to the table than they're costing. Yep, yep. And third week of September, did you say was the ideal time for drilling? Or, no, it was, or, a fortnight uh, too, it was a fortnight too late, but I couldn't get drilled cover crops till I'd got wheat off. Yep. I mean, that's, I think that's a common problem that oil seed rope drilling, if there's any oil seed rope going in the ground these days, and, and cover crops, it clashes heavily. So it, just it does, although I, if we've got, if we've sown cover crops between sort of 25th of August and 10th of September, roughly, that's about ideal for us. Um, I'm not too worried if it runs a week later than that, but any time beyond that, you need the right season from still to do a, a decent amount of good. This year has been terrible with some poor looking, with some good cover crops, but with some very poor ones this time, particularly where there's a lot of heads of spring barley on the floor. The volunteer barley has been far too yeah. much of a problem. Yeah. Okay. And then I suppose come come the spring and come destruction, you don't want a, a thatch on your soil surface. You want 50 50 cover crop and soil, or what, what's the ratio? Um, a bit more than that. Yeah. It's, if you walk, walk through it and see the soil while you're walking through it, that's fine. Um, yep. If I can see it, then the air can get to it. That, that's my yardstick, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough. That's great. Okay. Um, and, and what's the thoughts that? What's the thoughts of the future? Any any changes for the future in the strategy, or just keep on tweaking? Keep tweaking. Certainly, there's always a better way of doing everything. As I just as I just like outlined, the species of the cover crops is getting a bit more focus. Um, if ever we can reduce, if we reduce cultivation, reduce bed tilling particularly, not cultivation per se necessarily. But reduced bed tilling that that is that is certainly improving soil structure improves drainage it helps harvesting it helps travel ability traffic ability in the field i can't honestly believe how much good it has done um yeah if we find some ways of bringing more organic matter in uh, that's a bit more of a difficult nut to crack um but uh, softly softly catch a monkey sort of thing and no risk to yield or saleable product you know you haven't you haven't risked any greening or or uh, potatoes or um, not enough soil for the planter? No, we've, we've noticeably less greening. We, we're probably an inch shallower than we were 10, 15 years ago in, in terms of total working depth. But I, we were using what was there and we're pretty much doing the same now. A lot of, a lot of places with only nine and a half or 10 inch soil anyway. Uh, okay. we're not, we, ne we never have plowed it to the 14 inch deep. You see some people plowing at that sort of depth and pulling a lot of orange kelter onto the surface and <clears throat> it makes me cringe. Um, potatoes, do, if you plant them deeper, they don't necessarily place the tubers deeper in the row. The key thing to me has been reducing the row cracking on the surface, because if the rows yep. don't crack, the light can't get in. Yep. So you don't you don't need the depth the depth of row soil above the potatoes because it's not getting cracked. And that that fibrous material from the cover crops and, and the, all the, the finer roots and things like that help tie the rows together and and certainly with you they don't completely stop the, the, the cracking we've had some very challenging seasons the last two mm -hmm. um it, it is still evident but it's definitely a lot less than it used to be good 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 great stuff okay andrew well well thanks for that thanks for the chat um let's let's um if 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 you go back into the green room now as we call it and and we'll get you back out for the uh, there's no gin in there i'm afraid but we'll get you back out for the panel discussion and sure. and uh, We'll we'll have a bit more, a few more questions, some more questions coming in. Um, so that's that's great. So um, that leads us nicely on to our our, our final farmer speaker for today, uh, Will Gag, who uh, manages the potato operation for for Godfrey's in in North Yorkshire. Um, I think Will, you've you you'll be on overtime by the time you finish this job for us. Um, <laughs> so are you on mute, by the way? Take yourself off mute, Will. Yeah, sorry. Go. Now then, um, now yeah, then. yeah. So yeah, we're and it's it's North Lincolnshire, not North Yorkshire. <laughs> oh, did I say North Yorkshire? Sorry, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I no, mean no, North Lincolnshire. <laughs> All right, yeah. No, so, do you just want to introduce yourself? Um, I'm sure most people know you anyway, but just run through the business that you you manage. Yeah, um, basically, um, Godfrey's we primarily north lincolnshire we do go into east yorkshire as well um with uh, rough round figures about 1100 acres of potatoes um mainly all uh looking at the pre-pack market um yeah, we'll send a little bit into processing basically if it doesn't make the grade um 
the yeah basically primarily aiming at that uh, pre-packed market with with basically everything um two main soil types basically silts and um lincolnshire wold um soils um so the the walls are generally light free draining um stony soils um yeah there's small heavier patches here and there up there um and then down onto the silts um anything from a real nice uh, run your fingers through type silt to almost pretty much a you know, very clay based um and you know fields can change you know throughout all, all over down here um so yes yeah, so that's basically rough round figures what where we are and i suppose you have two very distinct cultivation strategies for the two soil types two completely different um so yeah so basically up on the walls um as far as cultivations go we generally plow and that dependent on the again the soil type up there anything with a slightly bit more body in there we do plow um as a winter plow um and then ridge up um but in the general consensus is that we plow in spring um it tends to dry uh, plow over drier and dry out um quicker and easier um ridge up um you know as soon as we can afterwards um go straight in with uh de stoners and then plant um into those uh, de stone beds um down on the silts uh we generally winter plow um and then again very similar to a super flow style drag um we actually had it specifically made for us uh by challenger um a drag but with what i'd class as like basically like a norfolk tine in there um to go through basically create air into the soil and just basically without ripping up too much um yeah without pulling up too much wet basically just that um uh nice um again depending on the field um and conditions you know depending on that depends on the depth of that um but basically it, putting air into the soil about 24 hours in advance um of either a power harrow or a uh, hook time cultivator um we specifically run basley airs here um and then that leaves a flat top for us we're not in beds we're just flat top um to which we have a um a tiller planter combination go through um and uh, as i say cultivation very all depends dependent on field really of uh yeah we some we may not power harrow at all um some may just be a very very quick basley air and some may be a very slow um dependent on the actual soil yeah okay and um we we've been talking we, we've been talking with uh, uh amanda um that um or amber even that the basilares do you want to change and look at different options it, hook tines on the basilares or is, yeah is i mean cool? currently we're running hook tines and um yeah as, as part of this process i, I said you know, straight up i don't know if we are doing the right thing and i wanted to sort of challenge that so obviously this next season in conjunction with yourselves um we are looking at trying to um a very depth and that basically came out of a conversation two years ago with Kerr um when I was up in Scotland there um and just basically looking to see if we can you know create this less is more so um yeah so we, we, we I'm very keen on looking at different depths of that whilst also looking at different effectively blades like for example um you know traditionally everyone in this area said oh yeah you don't you don't want an l blade on this type of land well not to sound silly why um you know i know obviously the the keep saying compaction and um and things like that but you know personally i've never had any uh, experience of it um i've been working these types of lands for, for 16 years now and um yeah um I want to challenge that and just see see if it might be the right thing. So, so what will be the alternatives to a hook time for the basil air? What is it? Just a straight time? Um, potentially a straight time, potentially an, an, an L blade, 
time in a different type of machine. Um, you know, I want to have a look at you know the whole the whole scenario basically. And a, and an L type, I suppose that that's a hangover from the old Howard Rotovator, which kind of smeared a a pan. Is that what you what uh, we're thinking with an L an L uh, blade on a on a rotary tiller? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that that's the concern is obviously whether we get that pan, um, which we don't obviously we don't want. Um, but again. Uh, yeah, I want to challenge it and just see what and why, and also as, as part of this, cost it. You know, if we can create more by doing less, and um, yeah, basically, I just want to I want to challenge those theories basically, and and see um, yeah, see if we we can burn less fuel per hectare, and and uh, see. In the end of the day, every one of us is here for the, you know that magical P word. And yeah, we've, we've we've got to get that profit, simple as. And yeah, that's what we're going to try to do. And I think um, I think reducing the amount of energy that goes into it gives you more wriggle room. So you've you're not. I can see here that we're not reducing the amount of sheet machines you have on farm, but you're releasing men and machines to go on to other things in a very busy period. I guess that's a, a benefit, fringe benefit, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it, it is a very, a very, very busy farm. And yeah, um, but also on the other flip of it, I'm, I'm not. Um, I, I will never rule out. You know, if we are going to have to do an extra pass um, to create that better, um, uh, that better yield. I mean, in the end of the day, with us being primarily packing as well, we can't compromise quality. Um, quality is key for ourselves, um, even regardless of yield. Um, we've, we've got to try create that. So if if something is going to basically compromise quality, it's, it's not worth it to us. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do. Yeah, I think that's, and I think that we gain that loud and clear from all of the the, the, the comments on Twitter and and, uh, and other social media that you can't compromise on quality. And I think people worry about um, doing less because they'll get less sellable quality. Okay. Yeah. And and what are the two different ploughing depths are you going to go at uh, for this spring? Um, we're basically going to try. Um, we're probably going too wildly different, but basically, um, our, our farm standard is uh, just over twelve inch on our silts, um, or twelve to thirteen inches um, in there. And um, yeah, basically, um, for this trials field this this year, we've got that standard depth, whilst also we've got a nine inch depth as well. Um, well, it's actually a, a, a fraction fraction under. Um, nine inch so yeah so we've we've done that um up in our wall land basically we are the sort of 10 to 12 inches of depth um some if you go too deep you do just fetch too much stone up um so again it depend depends on the soil up there depends yeah. On the field. yeah yeah and and were the um just remind me on the will this these trials be happening on both sites on both soil types or just the one Primarily this year, it was it is just on the uh, on the silts. We we did plan for all this last year, um, and then good old wonderful COVID raised its head. Um, just as I think it was about a week before we were about to send the plow in, and um, basically, obviously, we had to restructure, re rethink all our trials. Um, yeah, you know, with uh, with what we could do. Now, obviously, now we've had more time to. Um, get around that and um you know even for this year we are um worst case scenario we're planning that if we can't hold events you know I, i've videoed everything um on farm of what we're going to do um so uh, so hopefully either which way we will have good um uh, good plans and good good trials to be able to show for next year yep 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 great stuff super job um, and then also just just um, cultivations aside, you've got some interesting work going on in, in irrigation as well coming up at Spot North. Um, yeah, well, to be honest, we did, we did that, that this last season, an awful lot of irrigation work of uh, trickle um, uh, against boom and gun. And yeah. we published that earlier that, this week. Um, so, yeah, so uh, um, we've done, uh, done, done a fair share so far. Yes, so. yeah, yeah. That's good stuff. Good stuff. Right. Well, 
that's that's great. Uh, thanks, Will, for that. Um, then it's four o'clock. I think we'll 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 bring everyone in for a a bit of a panel session. We've got some questions um, that have have come in. Got Keir, got Philip, got Andrew. Okay, that's great. Um, so the first question really from from David Hoyles uh, in down in South Links, um, really directed at Keir. And I think Keir, you might have answered this, but we'll we'll do it as a as a kind of a an old group team effort, if you like. Um, if you, Keir, if you're only uh, bed tilling 15 to 20 percent of your land are you planting straight into s stone separated land that has already been ploughed yeah i mean the our sort of uh, our, our standard practice we winter plough um then we would go in with a set of ridges ridge up some beds and then the, the decision needs to be made whether we need to bed till or not so most of the time we're not bed tilling so we just go straight in with a stone separator after the stone separator planter and that's it that's the sort of uh, the the basic the basic we, we, we have tried and somebody mentioned the tiller star earlier on we tried that in our, our first year of demonstrations um output was probably the biggest comment it's very very slow it, uh, although we only tried it in one field the guy that we actually borrowed it from said that we don't really do a certain height of field either heavy field or, or a light field not really much in between i don't know how um, how good a comment that is, but the, the sort of big thing we we struggled with, or the guy that was driving it struggled with, was uh, big stones. You know, it, it would bury the stones underneath the bed. It would bury anything up to I think about eighty mil. Once you were over eighty mil, the guy was out picking the stones off and, and throwing them on the front box of his tractor. So, I mean, I don't know what everybody else is like stone wise, but certainly we'll be yeah we'll have a lot bigger st stones up in Scotland than, than eighty mil, and as it. Uh, as it turns out, the guy probably took longer to do. I think we're doing. He, he did a pass up and down the field, and it took him longer to do that than it took us to do most of the rest of the trials put together because he was just he was constantly stopped. Yeah, and and um, and it's just a, a, a secondary question. If you you destone everything, you declod everything, Keir? Yeah, we do. Uh, as a whole, we do. We do have a, a wee bit of really light sand that's got no stone in it. Um, if we had the proper machine, we would probably go straight in and just make up some beds, you know, set hoods on the back of a, a bed tiller type machine and, and plant straight in the back. But no, predominantly everything gets stone separated. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Super. Okay, okay. Right, let's have another another look for another question. Um Ah, Tom Rees, uh, from Pembrokeshire. Um one for Philip really. Um have you found any um difference in between not ploughed that follow a cover crop. Um, so, are we in ploughing in cover crops? Um, does the cover crop provide organic matter that can that stops the planted bed to slumping? So, more organic matter can it prevent slumping of the bed? Certainly, um, Harry. Uh, as a principle, um, if you can, if you can improve the you're looking at sort of short-term organic material really with with fibers and roots and the longer term uh build up but um i think both will and andrew made some very good points that if we can get fibers in there which is very much short term um they're key to holding holding soil apart and stopping it running together and um yeah I, I'm, I'm a big fan of growing roots through soil so I, I, I would encourage everyone to do that. Um, I, I, it's absolutely a fact that I think the you should judge a cover crop by what's under the ground. I've learned that the hard way. Um, you don't necessarily need a beautiful looking canopy. You're probably far better off without it. As long as you've got the roots growing through there, they're doing a, they're doing what you want. They're, they're providing the, the path, maintained pathways as well as starting to improve that friability as well. Um, massively important, yeah. Yeah, Anyone else, Andrew, would not, any any comment on that? I would agree with that wholeheartedly, yeah. It's, it's what's under the ground is much, just as important and more so as what's on the surface. And if we, if we can keep that fibrous material in the row rather than buried in a layer underneath it, we can get extract much more value from it. Yeah, yeah. And Will or Care, have you have you been involved in cover crops and found any anything similar? 
Personally, on our farm, not yet, but again, it's something we've been actively looking at, um, at other people, you know, um, other people's experience, like Andrew's and things like that, this last few years. And all being well this summer, that is going to be our first establishment of these crops um, for doing that. Yeah. We've, we've been trying to leave a cover crop in, uh, I think it was 2018, with uh, the, the actual spot field was big field. Uh, the bottom sort of half was heavier, wetter type soil. It was uh, the, the bottom half was sown out in cover crop, top half was winter ploughed. And the, the thought there was in till the bottom half only if we could prove that by sowing a cover crop we could get the you know get the get the roots down hopefully break up the soil and then we'd come in we'd plow that a couple of days before the planter went in and then we'd ridge it all up and if we didn't have to bed till then that was going to be a bonus for us it didn't quite work that there were uh, there were advantages the soil was noticeably drier than it would have been um but we still did need to bed till a wee bit, but not maybe as much as we, we probably would have without a cover crop. Harry, I think it's just worth one little mention that if if you guys are starting to consider cover crops as, as, as part of the system, then if you can actually integrate a soil loosening process into that and use the cover crop to draw some moisture, that can help the loosening because it can make it more effective. Um, it might not always be the case, but it, I've had some quite good results by loosening through a growing cover crop with a sward lifting type action. Um, so you've got the, you've got the crop growing, and if it starts to tell you its roots are struggling in places, uh, which is possible, then um, if it's dry enough and if it's drawn some moisture, there might just be a little bit more chance for a window to to actually loosen through that. It will then uh, power its roots through and hold that open. Um, so you can get a bit of a win-win with that. Can I just put, add a caveat to that, Philip? In that I think that's quite soil tight to dictated on totally. on slightly more bodied land and more clay content. I think that can create us more problems than it solves. So I've stumbled across that with uh, sugar beet land, shaker it in winter and plowing it in spring and turning everything to goo. That that was an experience I don't want to repeat. But on on drier sandy land, if you've got a pan on sandy land, what you say is absolutely spot on, correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Doug. Um, John, a, a question from John Ewells. Um, it might, I might want him to re-ask it, but uh, um, are our KitKat, KitKat ridge profile on silts maximising depth of fear of greening not appropriate? So I guess he's saying, is, is should you just go as deep as you can to, to avoid greening? Um, but KitKat ridge, that's a new one on me. Do someone want to um, explain what a KitKat ridge is? It is what it says. Basically, it looks like the end of the end of a Kit Kat row. Uh, um, so, yeah. so yes, yeah, so flat top, straight sides. Um, I'll be honest. We've actually um, purposely moved all our, you know, both planters onto Kit Kat rows. Um, we actually found that greening actually improved, you know, by using them. Um, it, you know, for us, it took a lot, a lot of fine tuning. I'll be honest um and just making sure we had an actually slightly wider row um and um yeah so it basically it wasn't just sort of like a domed slumped over effect it actually pressurized and created that um that row now as i say we're in silts and and walled style soils um sometimes if we've not got the soil on the walls yes it, it does slump off a little bit um, but in general, our, our greening's definitely, definitely improved on the, off the back of that. Yeah. Any, uh, Kerr or Andrew, any comment on that? I think I would agree with Will. I mean, we've, we've sort of got the, the boards on our planters that will leave a, everybody speaks about a Kit Kat sort of ridge. And I think it certainly does help with greening. Um, just, you can do a lot with the pressure in the hood as well. You know, you can retain a bit of soil if you're, if you're, um, you can also lose a lot of soil. It's uh, it's very very fine tuned. I think you need to be you need to be pretty. You need to have a, the, the best operator in the seat. Anyway. Yeah, I think you're right. yeah, 
yeah. we're, we're not in uh, in Kit Kat land really in this neck of the woods. But yeah, absolutely right. The, the planter man's king. Use what soil there is there. Get a slightly wider shoulders of the ridge are quite quite critical. But uh, yeah, it's what you say is bang on. Okay, great stuff. Um, all right. Uh, next question um, from uh, Archie Montgomery. Um, what is the best cover crop for not bunging up the de-stoner? Andrew, do you want to come in on that? Um, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, cost is a bit of a driver on the cover crop thing. There's some magical seed mixes out there for 30, 40 quid an acre that I stay well clear of. Um, I use oats and beans because I grow them anyway. Um, I've, so I've, got a, I've got a source of them. But if we get the height, or we've got a web de-stoner, and we think it's going to be a problem, just run the tatey topper over it and create, knock it back to stubble. You've still got the physical matter that you've topped. Although it doesn't look like it's much laid in the bottom, it's still there. And the root, crucially, the important bit below the surface, the roots, they're, they're still there as well. So the actual material above the, on the top, provided it's too thick and it's leaving you a wet surface, it isn't. the species don't really have an influence on that too much. It's what you do with it, really. Yeah, yeah it's more management than choice, I suppose. Okay, uh, Will or Kia, have you had any experience with that? Not, not really. I think that the best uh, we tried a couple of kings cover crop mixes, and we tried some winter oats. And in, in my opinion, when you look at it and you dig down with the speed, the winter oats was probably the one of the better cover crops for us. Um, it seemed to be a lot drier. There was a lot more. Um, sort of bod not body in the soil, a lot more sort of fibrous roots in the soil. I think out out of the three that we had in anyway, the winter oats would certainly be the best one. Okay. Yeah, I'd concur. Yeah. Uh, I say so far we haven't we haven't been in this realm, so yeah, we'll be uh, we'll be trying it this next year. I've read something recently about there being a, a allopathic effect of, of oats, which concerns me a little bit. I've not really considered that to be an issue really. It's sort of I think it was along similar lines to, to club root and rape. Has anybody seen any negative effects of that? I haven't personally. I can't say that I've noticed any negative effects of the oats at all, but I don't know if anybody else has. No. <clears throat> my, my, my experience of that is uh, not with potatoes, but um, it's just to avoid the oat dying off and senescing and dying off and exuding the... Um, the, the, the top the, the toxin and the, the producing that effect at the wrong time growth of the next crop you it, it's timing of destruction really they wants to be destroyed probably just a bit sooner than you would ideally want so it's not having that effect with the, with the emerging or growing next crop right yeah no good um okay uh, right, well, we've got another question here, um, just via text by David Wilson. Um, how much clod would like, growers like to see on top of the ridge? And those ridges could be there for up to 120 days and will weather down. The modern planters encourage overworking of the ridge to achieve that Kit Kat finish. Will, do you want to take that? With per a, with a personally, um, personally I, I, actually, I find you know, there's some clod there. Um, this Kit Kat still handles it very well, um, and uh, I do actually personally like to see a bit of clod on the outside. Um, certainly on our silt land, if we're not careful, we can have it run together too fine. I mean, you, you never know what's going to happen, you know, with the weather, you know, a week later, um, let alone um, all the way back through to harvest. And yeah, if we're not careful, we find if we work these soils too, too fine, they can just slump and run together too hard and, um, yeah, then create a bit of a nightmare at harvest. So, yeah, I'm quite happy with clodding the outside of my rows. Um, and, um, yeah, that Kit Kat, it, it does just seem to form it and um, it, it, even in with you know, a 40, 40 mil clod there. Um, and... Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it still forms very well. So then, we then weather's down. Yeah, I think actually, you know, the, the Kit Kat row, although it looks great, nice sides, square edges, looks smooth end to end. If you actually dig down in, you can still see a lot of clod in there. It's uh, 
it is a wee bit of a myth when you when you look at the field and think, oh, that's great, nice, fine tilt end to end. But until you actually dig down and have a look, you can still have a lot of clods in your in your Kit Kat finish, as they speak about. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a, an appearance thing, I think, is the Kit Kat thing. Yeah, the de yeah. the type of destoner can have an influence on where the clod is in the bed. I find a a, a holy starb machine without an un underweb or anything will tend to leave clod on the surface, and it looks like it's a bit rough. We used to run a, a webbed grimmy next to a sad reiki, and you could see the difference between the two. And there were, it, can, it could create running such mixed machines as that. It could create as a bit of a problem getting planter set up because yeah. things reacted differently. But the, those square corners need to be kept there. And if the soil's too fine, and you get a lot of heavy rain or strong wind, it can blow it off. We have a, a bit of an issue on the latest farm where we, where we do grow potatoes. We've, we've introduced cover crops there now. Finally, is is open to stubble schemes have, have ceased. Which is a, an absolute blessing to us, really. In that we would get wind blow if you if the rows were too flat topped and wide, which they, they were on that side because there was nothing coming out the side of the separator of any great consequence. You couldn't. You, you're wanting clod that wasn't there to, to hold the rows together. I'm hoping the cover crop this year will aid us in that because you can make the rows look fantastic at planting, and a month later there isn't much top cover. From we've had a lot of dry weather and wind, and suddenly we're re ridging the blooming things. Mm. It's the benefit of fibres through the soil as well, just having fibres in the profile. Yeah, absolutely key, Philip, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. Um, one directed at Andrew in particular from Sam Cook. Uh, any knock-on effects with the radish in cover crops adding to slug issues? Not as much as I've noticed, no. Even in a wet time, we have, I can't say that I've found slugs in them. Um, that said, I'm not growing paper or cara or any particularly susceptible varieties like that, where it would normally be an issue anyway. We, we use less slug pellets now than we used to do. That may well be that we're not re just putting them on routinely. We used to routinely do headlands once upon a time, thinking that field margins were fetching slugs in, and we don't do that anymore. Um, I can't see we have any slug, slug issues of any great consequence now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. Um, if I was growing things like kale or, or brassicas in them, that it might be different. Um, but on what we grow presently, no, it's not a problem. Okay. Anyone else got a comment? No. Okay, doke. Um, another another question from uh, from David Hoyles, uh, directed at Will. Are you doing your cultivation depth and different blade trials on your whole whole beach site or at North Links? Um, it's basically going to be based up at, at uh, North Lincolnshire, East Uft, um, up, up here. Um, yeah, that's basically where. Yeah, oh, good stuff. Um, uh, Archie Montgomery again. Uh, Andrew, do you take the skins off the plough to spread the biomass throughout the plough profile? No, but we probably should do because we're not actually doing anything other than being decorative, really. Um, the, the prior cultivation with the Simba TL has mixed all that that cup of material into the profile so that the skimmers aren't really doing anything at all. So, so, so we should probably take them off so we don't pair them out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and from Martin Cox. Um, oh, he's saying I'm very, chairing very well. That's good. Uh, career on BBC. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they pay enough. Um, any next question really is, any views on practice of stone removal to a certain site, um, stand, sand and flint in mid Norfolk? Stone removal, anyone who want to chair that? Oh, it's kind of yeah, I've done, done a little bit of that a few years ago on some limestone. Um, if we're going to take stone, stone off, I would advocate using a stone picker rather than putting an elevator on a deep stoner. Um, if the stone, the stone often helps keep the rows open, and if you take, take everything off. There's no aggregate there to, to assist with the drainage, and you finish up with, with too little soil left. We was a we hired a common steel stone belt as a contractor actually came and did it for us um, a few years ago, and it's it's difficult fitting that in as a task because it needs to be dry, power or a fine surface on the top. It only takes the stones off the very surface. Well, that tends to be where the, the biggest stone is, and that that can assist certainly because it's the big stone down the trench bottoms that creates the problem, but. We, we did have wild ideas about putting an elevation on the side of an old D stone that's been sat in the corner of an old fold yard for many a year, but came to the conclusion that it was going to do more damage than it was good by taking all, all the stone out. Okay, you just went on quiet there for 
Andy. I don't know what was going on. Um, but did you hear enough for it to make sense? Yes, I did. Yeah, we did. Okay. Um, next question from um, Andy Bolt. Um, problems growing radish as a cover crop and having all seed rape in the rotation, i.e. club root. Any any comments on that? Anyone? Good rape grower? Fortunately, we don't grow, grow oil seed rape and nor do any of the farms that, that we grow potatoes on already. So, so any amount that's a concern, if the odd bits that are there are in a very wide rotation, um, it's something I would look along the same lines as beans. I have a couple of farms where there's bean stem nematodes an issue, so I avoid putting beans in the cover crops. So if there was a lot of rape and club root, root risk, I would replace the radish with something else. Quite, so there's something else off the top of my head would probably be something like crimson clover because predominantly I'm growing the radishes for for PCN control and the deep tap root is a is certainly a bonus but there's some good uh, research out there now about different types of plants to put in cover crops and what each one does I saw a really good diagram on, on Twitter a few weeks ago put on by Cotswold Seeds and that's really good to show you what what roots are and what each particular element brings to the party and the negatives of them as well um, there's always choices basically yeah yeah great stuff will any any comment nothing to add and uh, no i mean uh, um i say we're still uh, we're still working away at that so uh, no we're not, not yet yeah and and Kerr, any any oil seed rape on your farm no no oil, no oil seed rape and likewise with well we've only just sort of dipped our toe in the water with the cover crops we've only had sort of one year um, in the spot trial, we've not sort of rolled out across the farm with pre-potatoes or anything like that. But it's, yeah, it's it's certainly something that is of interest. We've sort of, when we grew them in the cover crop field, we sort of struggled. But understand what Philip's saying. It's not all about what's on the top of the soil. It's what's underneath. You know, we would yeah. we'd walk through the cover crop and it would be three or four inches tall. We, we need to remember that we do farm in Scotland and the uh, conditions up here you know, if, if we can, if we could get them in mid August, late August, sometimes if we get a really bad sort of autumn back end, you know, we might only get an inch, a couple of inches of stuff through the top. But then you've also got to remember there's stuff going on underneath the soil. So, yeah, it's maybe something that we should sort of look at again. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Kerr. Um David Hoyles again. Uh, if you had to compromise on silt. Would you choose dry ploughing, potentially August, September, or possible wetter plough with the cover crop roots in? Personally, for myself, um, uh, I do love you know, getting on early as far as a, a good dry plough. Uh, you, know, you certainly can see as the ploughs on along, it's, it's cracked even the very bottom of the furrows. Um, and yeah, done a really, really fantastic job there. But again, it's something I'm quite keen to try this next year even if it means leaving it till spring um, and, and ploughing then um, with a the cover crop in, I think it, um, it, it's well worth us, us looking at and, and trying these ideas. If we, if, we, if we don't try, we don't know. Um, but um, yeah, I'm quite keen to do that. Yeah, any experience with you, Philip? Have you come across any, any thoughts? First port of call is to avoid plastic, wetter soil at all costs, really um because whatever the action you're putting on the soil then is going to be more compressive than it would be if it was drier um yeah moves all dry it stops dry old adage but um yeah i'd be very i'd be i'd be if i had a choice i, I would certainly try and move it dry um but i do accept that cover crops can move water out of soil as well so yeah. that yeah, it, 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 it's at least they're providing that benefit at the same time um but yeah avoid whatever you can avoid that the risk of compressive action will was talking about trying different times to applaud that um the principle you must adhere to is to is to avoid a time that's going to put a lot of compression on the soil uh, and that's all about its geometry really well so it's you can nearly work that out as you're going along mm -hmm. uh, be an interesting project that try and avoid compressive action wherever possible mm -hmm. okay i would say we, we used to pre-winter plow ourselves many many years ago and regularly granted it's slightly more bodied soil than, than silk probably is uh, but regularly enough we'd have something that was nice and dry and, and fine on the surface and some kind of pudding underneath 
Um, perhaps on occasion we were ploughing it a little bit too wet and that was creating a pan for the water to sit on. Um, but in the light of the amount of rain we've had in the, over the last two winters, however dry it was ploughed, I would suggest it's still going to be wet down there somewhere. Uh, my experience would tend to suggest that the cover crop is bringing as much and probably more to the party as regards, as regards drainage than it is water extraction through the cover crop actually sucking it up. Um, I always thought that when a root was dead, it would leave a drainage channel, and that was, was wholly wrong. Um, a live root seems to contribute far more to that. You can see that this morning with the amount of water we have stood around here, the fields with cover crops, and you can't see the puddles in. Mm -hmm. All right. Fair enough. That's good. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, Adrian Howell, uh, one for Philip, on sandy loam with a very high stone contact. Do you have any comments on the importance of cultivations after the po potato crop to restore some structure? Yeah, I think again, try and achieve that tensile failure rather than compressing it. Um, I wouldn't say less is entirely more, but the last thing I would want to do is go and destroy any form of um, cohesion that's there and, and bludgeon it to death, especially on a sandy loam. Uh, so I, I, I would go for a subtle stretch um, within limits of uh, making sure it is stretching it and not pushing it together. Um, yeah. Less is more. Yes. Yeah, sure. And um, just adding to that, we've got a, a, a webinar coming up next week on um, on uh, soil structure um, on the 27th of, of January, I believe. Um, Patrick Clubben, what about planting depth? How shallow dare we go? What's the what's the what's the optimum for you guys? Will what's the optimum? Potato well, as I said before, depth? actually, we, we, we're generally um, at 12 to 13 inches on our silts, uh, but we, this trial for this year, we've commit brought it out to nine. Um, a bit like all these things, you, you've got to just try it, and nine might be too much. It might be, we, we may end up being at seven inch. Um, in, a, in another yep. couple of years, I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, um, sort of four years ago, Mark Stallum, you know, challenged me about nitrogen, and slowly but surely, we've we've really, really pulled back on that. Yeah, 10, 15 kilos a time each year, and yeah, when he was saying that we're using forty to fifty kilos of nitrogen a hectare too much, you know, in actual fact, um, yeah, he was right. But it's obviously that, you know having the you know having the balls to do it basically and um yeah so we'll see not nine might be you know not enough yeah you know, we'll see we'll see where we go yep okay, okay. any, was the any question other about comments? planting depth was that was the question about planting depth or cultivation depth harry planting depth yeah how shallow dare we go uh, di variety dictating oh. for me something something like dell will plant it three and a half, four inch, when we used to grow Dell to last year. Um, but some vari some varieties, because uh, it's Dell grow down, but some varieties that grow up will we'll be down at maybe seven. We're not we're not as worried as we were about how close to the bottom of the bed we were. We don't want to be sat on the, on the, the soil where the East Owners share has been, but I'm not as concerned about it as I used to, because the, I think the width of the, of the ridge and what's in that ridge is more important than the actual depth of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with Andrew there. I mean, different varieties, different depths. We also grow, we grow a bit of osprey, and it's it's a variety that just goes straight down. You know, plant it at six or seven eight inches deep in, in your row, and you'll be cutting potatoes with the share of the hand kind of thing. We'd we'd plant that three inches, two two three inches, and it's it's still you know we're not getting any bother with it. Other varieties or other soil conditions, like we've also got some light land, but we plant. Um, probably seven inches deep in that because we know we're going to lose an inch off the top of the bed on a, on a dry windy day and it's it's also the, the type of soil it is it's not going to it's not going to give us bother at harvest time but as an average we would plant tubers at six inches deep I say slightly deeper for lighter soil and slightly shallower for different varieties yeah I'd agree yeah, yeah. yeah I'd, I'd back that up as well yeah we'd, I'd say our prairie farm average is about six inch um but um yeah, some were down at seven, some were right up at four. Um, it all, all depends on variety and soil. Ten, tend mm. to plant bigger seeds slightly deeper than smaller seeds as well. Mm. Yep. Okay, 
Okay, um, just getting to the last few questions now, and I realise it's uh, it's four thirty. So, um, a comment, quick comment from uh, Mark Stallam uh, on KitKat uh, profiles: uh, greater risk of capping owing to greater risk of capping owing to pressure on wet soils. Cracks can let light in, and greening can go up, um, but evidence is limited that uh, that is more or less beneficial for greening. So, just a um, comment on on. Kit I'd say that's probably where um, I, I'd probably add to that. It's basically that, that that is basically the man on the seat as well, of actually the pressure on that hood. Um, yeah, if, if it is those wetter conditions, if it lifts the pressure right off. I mean, our, our planter, you could lift the planter up with the pressure on the hood if you're not careful. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's that man on the seat and um, creating a good job with that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Adapting to conditions, it also highlights the need for the fibre in the ridge to, to stop that, that compaction. There's a fine line between com consolidation and compaction, and a little bit of consolidation is important to stop the, the rose falling out, particularly in a dry season. But too much pressure when it's wet, and it's uh, you've got the problem that's just been highlighted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The more fibre you've got, the more flexibility you've got really with that as well, haven't you? Yeah. Okay. Um, coming from Graham Skinner, uh, see, he sees more issues from cereal covers with destoners, especially with a, a no plough entry point. Um, so more, more, I suppose, more trash on the top if you're going in without ploughing. Yeah, made that mistake. Flail it off. If it's uh, if you've got got oats that are a foot high, take it off down to a stubble light, and that that problem disappears because the the base of the plants, the stems are, are much less leafy if you like so a lot, a lot less likely to hang on the bars of the destoner anyway and if it's only if it's only sort of three or four or five inch stubble height it isn't, isn't so much of a problem but yeah a, a foot of oats for, for sake of example no plow yeah we get that problem as well learn that yeah. lesson um and and finally we'll get well, a final comment from mark Stallum. um he, he's saying simon smart's work on hdb greening uh, fellowship showed that the outer five centimeters of the ridge or the bed was where the most greening occurred. So, coverage of soil and its retention is key, which you know is is a is a good point to finish on, I think, isn't it? Well, it's a bit of an obvious one, though, isn't it? The, the greening yeah. is going to occur on the outsides of the ridge. It's, it's a bit like saying the sun's going to be out during the day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we need more research on that, I'm sure, Andrew. <laughs> so, that's great. That, that's that's the the questions that um, that have uh, that we've got here. Um, it remains really for me to thank Will, Philip, Andrew, and Kerr for for your inputs. Um, it's it's been some good lively chat. We're moving to this kind of environment where we have less slides and more chat, which I think works when. Uh, when we get lots of good questions coming in so the the whole things work very well so um so thank you thank you to uh, to our speakers this afternoon um and just on the, as a closing spring's coming potato season's coming uh can we go around the around the room or around the around the screen one top tip from each of you about uh, the upcoming season what's the what's the, your top tip for uh, for spring cultivations, will conditions are more important than dates. Okay, you got the easy one then. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say patience. So, so was I. I was going to say patience as well. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 have a spade. Go for a dig rather than mm, the drive by. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's great. I was just. Uh, just suddenly remembered that's 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 super so thank you to uh, to our speakers for uh, for this afternoon that brings the uh, this session to a close and it also brings the all of the the uh, the week of um hdb potato sessions covering all manner of, of topics to a close as well um at the end of this there'll be uh, uh neuroso and basis points that you'll be able to pick up and uh, if you've registered or you, you've signed up, then you'll be able to uh, check back and we'll be putting these, um, all of the, uh, the, uh, the webinars online on YouTube and you can check back if there's something that you wanted to pick
pick up on in particular, then you can do that, and we'll send be sending the links out uh, later later this week, I think. Um, so that's it from me. Um, th thank you all very much for uh, attending. Thank you for your uh, for your uh, uh, um, inputs. It's always best to get good questions and 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 even the sticky questions we can always handle. We can always have a have a go at. Um, so from me, thank you very much. It's uh, it's twenty five to five, and I'll sign off. Thank you all. Bye. -bye.